Greetings and welcome to the Bible Truth Commentary. I'm your host, Dr. Matthew Mahan. And on this broadcast, I'd like to start a series of broadcasts on the covenants in the Bible. And uh, normally we do a verse-by-verse exposition of some book of the Bible, such as Mark or Isaiah. Uh, In this case, I'd like to do a special study uh, on the covenants. I've been wanting to study in depth uh, the, the subject of the covenants in the Bible for quite some time. Not that I haven't studied it before, not that I haven't noticed it before as I've read and studied through the Bible, but I've been wanting to do an in-depth study, and now I'd like to um, show you some of the things that the Lord has shown me about the covenants in the Bible. And I think this is a very important subject. Now, I believe that the best way to understand the whole Bible and understand the context of any topic, understand any doctrine, any subject matter, or a series of events in the Bible, and understand them correctly, you have to study each and all of the covenants in the Bible. A covenant in the Bible is an arrangement that God makes between himself and with man. This is an in-depth study of the covenants of the Bible, and on this broadcast, we will give you an introduction to the covenants in the Bible. By the time you finish this series of broadcasts, if you stay with us, you should be able to, one, define what a covenant is by Bible definition, two, identify the eight covenants of God, three, identify who the covenants are made with, what their purpose is, what is conditional and what is unconditional in these covenants, who the covenant applies to and who it doesn't apply to, and in what ways it doesn't or does apply to these people, and what time periods they span you will be able to identify why replacement theology is not biblically acceptable. You'll be able to identify how each of the covenants has application to the age of grace and in what way it does. Also, you'll be able to understand what aspects of the new covenant apply to Israel and which aspects apply to the church. Seven, you'll be able to describe the differences between a covenant and a testament and how they are related. <clears throat> and many such other things that you will be able to identify after you finish this study. Now, before I start, I'd like to read um, Clarence Larkin from his Dispensational Truth. He has a chapter on the covenants in his book, and I thought that uh, it was a pretty good uh, introductory paragraph that he wrote in his commentary. So let me go ahead and read this to you. A covenant is an agreement or contract between men or between men and God. Generally, it is based on certain conditions agreed upon. Sometimes, as between God and man, it is unconditional. God's covenants with man originate with him and generally consist of a promise based on the fulfillment of certain conditions. God has made eight covenants with man. They all relate to the earth. Each one introduces a new dispensation, which simply means God dispensing his program to men. Six of them are given to individual and representative men as Adam, Noah, and Abraham, and also David, and went into effect during their lives except the one given to David, which took effect at the birth of Christ. Each one has a time element and expires at a certain time. Four of them are distinguished by a sign, and then he refers you to the chart on the covenants. Okay, so I thought that was pretty good. Now, I I don't agree with Larkin on some of the things he says about covenants and some of the things he teaches. I differ a little bit. I differ on some of the covenants uh, and uh, their application, uh, but nobody's going to agree completely, okay? Now, a lot of this material is what we will call biblical history and doesn't have a direct bearing on your salvation or how you get to heaven. But, In other words, it's not devotional material, okay, or how to get saved. But it does transcend that. It's about God's plan that he sovereignly laid out for all people at all times. And it has to do with God's dealings or arrangements he established with people down through the millennium. A grasp of these relationships between God and his creation are quintessential to a proper interpretation of every verse in the Bible. These covenants form the warp and woof, or the fabric of the laws by which any verse in the Bible is understood in its intended and proper context. Now, the word covenant comes from the Hebrew word bereath, and that comes from the Hebrew bara, which means a covenant. 
okay? There are certain laws of correct biblical interpretation, and these laws include a proper application of the covenants among other laws that govern proper interpretation of Scripture. As an example of biblical law, you have the law of first mention. It is key to the meaning of the word throughout the Bible. For example, take the word love. The first mention of love deals with a father's love for his son. In this case, it's Abraham's love for his son, Isaac. <clears throat> and it's found in Genesis 22, 1 to 2. So this would be the love of a father for his son. And here we find Abraham and Isaac, a type of the father and the son, that is God the father and God the son, in many particulars. There are several verses in the New Testament that echo this love that God the Father had toward his son as typified by Abraham and his son. In Matthew 3, 17, it says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and, lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And, lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> Excuse me. Matthew 17, 5 says this. Um, and this is at the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus when he took Peter and James and John up into a high mountain. And it says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Now, if you can imagine a perfect love, that's the perfect love that would have existed between God the Father and God the Son within the Trinity eternally in a perfect bond. Now, God sent us his own son. But what, they did, what did they do to him? Jesus was a prophet and foretold how he would be treated in the following astonishing parable that has its basis in Jewish history, all right? And it deals with the love that a father has for his son. Luke 20, 13, Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth the husbandman and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season he sent a servant to the husbandman that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard, but the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent another servant and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And these people are, are um, actually in a parable. They are typifying the prophets and various Old Testament um, uh, witnesses that God brought up against the Jews and their, their crimes. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, that is, the scribes and Pharisees and, and elders, and when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written, The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. All right. John 3.35. Jesus said this, he said, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. In John 5, 20, it says, Then answered Jesus, and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raised up the dead and quickeneth them, excuse me, as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That all men should honor the Son, and even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son 
uh, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. So the first principles of love, in particular the love of a father has for his son, are found in the events regarding Abraham offering up his son Isaac in Genesis 22. Just an example of the law first mentioned in the Bible, there's also this law of the covenants in the Bible that govern the proper interpretation of each period of time that God deals with men. The first mention of the word sinner is found in Genesis 13, 13. <clears throat> That's interesting that it's 13, 13. There are many definitions of sin, but in the Bible, there's a significant first and definitive use of the word sinner and it's found in Genesis 13. The first sinners in the Bible are defined in a reference to the men of Sodom, Genesis 13, 13. So we see that the law of first mention in the Bible sets the meaning of the word throughout the Bible. Likewise, the covenants in the Bible define the laws by which God holds various people accountable to himself through various periods of time. Likewise, the laws governing the obligatory relationship that men have with God, based on the framework God himself established with men down through history, that is, biblical history, are understood in God's covenants. They are the key to understanding what God expects of every person on the face of the earth, including you and including me. And just as there are physical laws that govern the universe, so there are spiritual laws that bind man's relationship to God, who is a spirit, and that govern God's relationship to man. And the framework of this relationship is dispensed in the form of various covenants. Now, a covenant is an arrangement or agreement between God and man. Sounds a lot like what Larkin said, I know. This is extremely important. A marriage is a covenant with a sign sealed with a ring. There are seven major covenants with an additional one called the covenant of circumcision. Actually, there's eight, but one of them is a fuller manifestation of the other, and that's the new covenant. We'll come back to that, okay? But there are eight in all. And then there's a covenant of circumcision that God made with Abram and his seed after him that uh, in order to be in on the other covenants, that is that Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, which we'll talk more about later, you had to be circumcised to um, enjoy its privileges, okay? Um, but this um, additional covenant of circumcision acts as a sign or a seal uh, for access to the Abrahamic covenant. That's what I think Romans calls it, a sign and a seal. I think it's in chapter 4, if I'm not mistaken. For access to the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenants, when they were in effect. Here we will look at seven different covenants coming out in eight of the arrangement arrangements that God ever made with man on earth. It isn't about a history of man seeking God and making agreements with God, but it's a history of God seeking out and dealing with man. You know, the Bible says, for the Son of God has come for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God sought us. Um, the book of Romans says there's no man that seeketh after God because that's not where our heart is inclined. God had to find us, and we couldn't even find God if we tried to without him revealing himself to us. We'll get into that more later. There are certain conditions for these covenants, and they don't end with the man himself that that covenant is made with, but with those who live afterward. Every covenant has some application to the church age. This is very important. And by the way, I thought I thought Larkin mentioned it. Maybe he did. But every every covenant begins a dispensation, okay? But each dispensation ends in collapse. And we'll come back to that more. But this is very important uh, because every covenant does have some application to the church. And there's other aspects of these covenants that don't have application to the church. And that's where people get in trouble. All right. And this is very important. And it's the key to see how they apply to us, uh, as well as how they don't apply to us. And it's also uh, important to understand what doesn't apply to us doctrinally, as well as covenantially, and what are agreements belong to someone else, and what agreements that we can't claim as promises to us. 
Now, if the covenant doesn't apply to us directly or doctrinally, it still affects how we interpret the scriptures to know how they relate to us. This requires study and a considerable amount of effort. What could be more important than to understand and know every arrangement that God made with every man on earth? The first covenant, the Edenic covenant, for example, did not end as to its application at the end of the period of innocence or where the law came in or when Christ came in or with the church age or with the end of the tribulation. But it comes out in the millennium with the restoration of all things. <clears throat> and so there is a complete circle in the creative plan of God. Creation to fall to restoration. To find out how any of these covenants apply to the church age, that, that is the age of grace that we're living in now, and where it doesn't, like I said, you have to study. And hopefully this series of broadcasts will help you in your understanding of these covenants as you study and try to understand the covenants with me. So we will study the agreements God made with man and see which ones are in effect, which ones are not in effect, and then when and in what way and how long they are in effect. Let's take an example. Let's take the covenant from Genesis called the Noahic covenant. Okay, it's found in Genesis 6. Let me start reading at Genesis 6:17. And the Lord had, uh, had, he was very, very saddened. Yeah, the Lord has feelings. He has emotions, okay? He doesn't have feelings, but he has emotions, okay? And God was um, sickened. I mean, when, when he saw how, what had happened to mankind in the earth and how they had corrupted their way, <clears throat> and uh, so he decided to bring a flood upon the earth. So in Genesis six seventeen, we read as follows, and I'm going to keep reading. He says, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee, speaking to Noah, will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. So it's not only Noah, but it's his family. And of every living thing of all flesh. So now notice every living thing of all flesh is all also <clears throat> being uh, included in this covenant. Two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind. Of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> excuse me, notice that this covenant is not only established with Noah and his family, but with every creature of all flesh. The first use of the word covenant in the Bible is found here in Genesis 6.18. Notice the family and the animals. Also notice that there seems to be no time limit on this covenant. After Noah and his family come forth from the ark, God has more to say about this covenant and adds to it. So I'm going to read Genesis 8, 18 through 9, 17. It's going to be a pretty lengthy passage, but I want to introduce you to this idea of a covenant, okay? Because this is a good example, the covenant God made with Noah and his family and the animals. Verse 18 of chapter 8, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. I, I love how matter-of-fact the Bible is. It really is just boom, boom, boom. And Noah builded an ark, uh, excuse me, an altar unto the Lord, and took, he'd already built the ark. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, you might remember he was told to bring seven of the clean ones. So he didn't just have two, you know, he had extras, and they probably reproduced during the time that a year or so that they were on the ark. Notice the sacrifice with the animals. Now, after Noah offers a sacrifice, God adds to the covenant that he made back in chapter 6. So let's read on at verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. 
For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything, everything living as I have done. <clears throat> now notice, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. All right, now verse 22. Notice it said there, while the earth remains. So question, is the earth still here? Of course, yes, it is. So this covenant or promise remains even to this day. It applies to us and will continue until the earth burns up in 2 Peter 3, when God renovates the earth by fire and makes a new heaven and a new earth. All right, reading on with chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, which it still is, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So the implication is God had previously given them the green herb. In other words, they were vegetarians prior to the flood. But now there's a change in diet, whereas before they were vegetarians. Now look at what it says. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. So now Noah and his descendants are allowed to eat meat or flesh. All right, verse 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. So you have to spill out the blood when you eat the meat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. So now God institutes capital punishment. You see that things are changing here. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by a man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. That's the reason why um, we are not allowed to take the life of another person. Because that person was made in the image of God. And only God can make that decision about when that happens. And when we interfere with that then that's called murder and God instituted capital punishment for murder back then all right verse 7 and you be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein and God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him saying and I watch it behold I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant, there it is again, with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither uh, shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. All right, so a promise God gives here, never to drown the world by a flood. And in verse 12, we read this. And God said, this is the token of the covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Notice the token of the covenant. A token is a sign for this covenant. This covenant is worldwide and to every creature. And that sign is a rainbow. All right. And I, he says, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Verse 13. All right. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. All right, so the rainbow actually belongs to the believers in God uh, as a token that God uh, will not destroy the earth again uh, with every living thing on the earth by a flood. All right, note, for, note from verse 15, this is a covenant that is an everlasting one and with every living creature of all flesh, including the animals then. And this is the token of the covenant which I have established, uh, me and all flesh that is upon the earth. 
Um, so this is God's token of the covenant, the rainbow, and that includes all animals. He said the same thing in verse 16, so he is repeating it here. Listen again now, verse 16, And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, you know, the Bible does use a lot of repetition when it wants to drive a point home. So here's an example where God made a covenant with a man, but it can apply to more than just that one man. The effects are far reaching and reach all the way to the new heaven and the new earth. So as long as the earth is here, you're gonna have seasons, you're going to have uh, uh, the rainbow as a reminder. And, uh, and man's program is he's going to be able to, uh, to eat um, meat as well as vegetation. And there's capital punishment. And uh, now God is picking man up, okay? And we'll talk more about that later. And establishing a new dispensation, which we call the Noahic dispensation. Now we'll come back to this. It's not really the Noahic dispensation, but it started a new time. The, the, the antediluvian or after the flood period of time. Okay, when God resumes his dealings with man as they uh, replenish the earth and are fruitful and multiply therein. So we'll come back to this covenant as we come through each one of the covenants in the Bible one by one in more detail. And we'll have more to say about it. For now, I just want you to see how the effects of the covenant can extend forward beyond the people the covenant is made with and can apply to people and animals down through human history. God has set certain laws and boundaries, and now they're fixed. These covenants are not just church-age doctrine. These covenants represent the basis of God's dealings, not only with mankind, but with his entire creation. <clears throat> These covenants encompass everyone and everything for all time, from beginning to end, and from the one who made you, and uh, he made everything Excuse me, that exists. So here's an introduction to the covenants. There are seven, or actually eight, by their application. All right, first of all, the Edenic. Second, the Adamic. Third, the Noahic covenant. Fourth, the Abrahamic covenant. Fifth, the Mosaic covenant. Sixth, the Davidic covenant. And seven, the new covenant in partial manifestation, that is partial application to the church. I call it the new covenant ecclesiastical. And then eighth, <clears throat> excuse me, the new covenant in full manifestation with full application to restored Israel. And I call it the new covenant in kingdom manifestation. All right, I'd like to close by looking at this chart designed by Clarence Larkin. So I'm going to need to pull this up here. This is going to be kind of hard to do, and it's going to be kind of hard for me to uh, manage this a little bit. I'm going to try to get this up here where I can see you, uh, see it. And this is the, um, the book that I was just reading from. This is the chart that he was referring to that he put together. So I want to take a look at this chart, and this is out of his book, Dispensational Truth, wherein he gives his concept of how the covenants are laid out. His model differs from mine slightly in that he does not apply the Davidic covenant until Christ is born. So here, I'm going to have to kind of look in here, but uh, here is where uh, Christ all right, is born, and that's where he brings in the Davidic covenant. I bring it in here during the, in the middle of the law, after the law had been given, okay, after the Mosaic and as part of the Mosaic covenant, but I, I see it as uh, um, being applied again, future for the future of Israel. But anyway, um, so um, differs slightly with mine. And I, I taught that the new covenant did not apply, well, he taught, excuse me, that the new covenant didn't apply to the church in any form. And I, I don't agree with that. I think there's partial application you can see in Hebrews 10, but the application in Hebrews 8 has to do with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which is not us, and is a direct quotation of Jeremiah 31, 31. So he's got the new covenant out here, okay? And, uh, but I start, I have partial application to the age of grace, but full manifestation 
out here in the millennium. All right. And um, all right. So while our models may differ in a few details, the important takeaway from this uh, study of these covenants is that they are the arrangements God made with these people that fix our relationship to God's plan in every age and what he expects from us and what he expects from others down through human history. All right, so notice how each covenant has a starting point and continues forward into the future, affecting more than just the ones God established the covenant with. For example, and he's got them numbered here, all right, number one was the Edenic covenant. However, the Edenic covenant, uh, man disobeyed. It was conditioned on obedience, and because man disobeyed, this covenant ceased, okay, and it won't see its manifestation and, or, or it won't see its uh, renewal until out here in the new heavens and the new earth. All right. And then you have the second covenant here mentioned is the Noahic, uh, I'm sorry, the Adamic covenant. And the, um, the extent of the Adamic covenant reaches all the way here until the earth is renovated. So all human history uh, that uh, engulfs. Then the third covenant mentioned here is the um, Noahic covenant, which is the one we just read about that God made with Noah. And again, this covenant has application to everything for all time on earth, as long as the earth remains, okay? Then the next one is the Abrahamic covenant. Now this covenant uh, has to do with the Jews and it has to do with their land and it has to do with also God bringing the Messiah and blessing the world. And we'll look into that more. So this Abrahamic covenant uh, extends all the way to eternity because it's an everlasting covenant, okay? And then the next one is the, uh, the Mosaic covenant when the law is given by Moses, and that comes all the way to the cross. Jesus nails the law to the cross. However, there's still application to it as far as the millennium and the millennial, um, uh, the law of the kingdom, okay? So it has application all the way through the millennium. All right, then the, uh, uh, the Davidic covenant comes in here during the time of the law, during King David when he was a king, and it has to do with his seed, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and has to do with an eternal kingdom. So it goes on out here into eternity. And then you've got the new covenant with partial application to the church, and the... Um, uh, full manifestation of the new covenant out into the millennium. And each one of these periods of time ends in collapse, even the one in the millennium, because Satan is loose for a time and deceives a nation, and there are people that re rebel against God at the end of the millennium. But every dispensation, each one of these periods of time ends in collapse, and then God establishes a new covenant. Okay, so that's, that's Larkin's model of it, which uh, I'm going to draw up my own model of that which I'll share at some point during the, this, these series of broadcasts. But you can see how each covenant, okay, has its application. And uh, you know what? I just lost my spot. I'm sorry. Here. Um, give me a second here. Here we go. <clears throat> All right. So we said that each covenant has a starting point, continues forward into the future, affecting more than just the ones uh, God established the covenant with. All right. Also that each covenant ushers in a period of time that ends in collapse or human failure. Uh, and actually everything between the Edenic covenant all the way up until the end of the millennium, uh, all of that is God's dealings in restoring, okay? Restoring what was lost. And God, only God can do that. So the Edenic was lost at the fall. And there will be a restoration at the time of the new heaven and the new earth. All the covenants in between, like I said, have to do with the arrangements God has made with us after the fall as God brings about reconciliation, redemption, and restoration. All right, then the Adamic covenant, which we saw, uh, and uh, we see how aspects of the uh, Adamic covenant extend forward all the way to when the earth is renovated. And it's an earthly covenant and it has an ending point. Likewise, the Noahic covenant, as we saw, it's also an earthly covenant and has an ending point. 
The Abrahamic covenant comes into out into eternity. It's everlasting. It has no end point, and it's an everlasting covenant, and it's far-reaching. Everyone that God blesses through not only Abraham and his seed, but also through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Davidic covenant has to do with the kingdom, and as part of the Abrahamic covenant, will go out into eternity as well. And then the Mosaic covenant applies up to the cross and resurfaces in its kingdom aspects in the millennium. It ends with the end of time. And then the new covenant sees a partial manifestation in the church age, but doesn't come into full manifestation until the millennium. And uh, Larkin doesn't show it until the millennium because, like I said, he doesn't believe it applied to the church. But we'll come back to this covenant later in our study and explain this distinction uh, between how it applies now in the church age, which is what we're in now, and the future millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back. All right. I hope you'll continue to study these covenants with us, and I promise you that this study will greatly strengthen you and give you a more extensive knowledge of God's overall plan and how the Bible fits together. In our next study or broadcast, we'll look at the meaning of the word covenant and why that is important. Then we will study each of the eight covenants in order and in depth. I hope you will stay with us for this study. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and increase your understanding of his inspired, preserved, majestic word. Amen.